Good morning and welcome to Tools for Workplace Inclusion. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under the Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray. I'm the project manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage Programme. This is the final session of our events themed as Finding Time, through which we are exploring the areas of business planning that sometimes get viewed as nice to have rather than essential. Today, we're exploring inclusivity at work in the approaches and tools that you can use to improve practice. Following the session, we will be providing you with some resources and tools that you can use, but these need to be used alongside authentic, embedded, inclusive strategies and practices. The tools alone are not a magic fix. This is the partner session to last week's Inclusivity at Work. The recording is now available on our website, and I'm going to drop the link into the chat right now. Please do use this recording as part of your learning and an advocacy tool. And thank you for joining us and making today's session a priority in your day. A little bit of housekeeping for you before we begin. Audience members, your cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout. There is a lot of content to cover in today's session. We will have a short Q&A at the end, but please be aware that we usually receive far more questions than we can answer live in the session. However, on the programme, we will be offering an opportunity to continue these conversations, and I'll be mentioning a little bit more about that in a moment. The chat is switched on today. Please do say hello and interact with your fellow attendees and also let us know if you have any tech issues. Do make sure you have your chat set to all panellists and attendees if you want to share with the whole group. There is a drop down option where you type into the chat and you can change who receives your messages. We have live captioning available today, which you can switch on via your Zoom menu. And we will be recording today's session and making it available on our website afterwards. Just a little bit for you about the Rebuilding Heritage Programme. We're providing training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We're offering free resources such as today's session, which will be openly available online, as well as one-to-one -one and group support, which you can access by application. Applications for round four, which is to receive support in May and June, are opening on Thursday, the 11th of March. Full details are available on our website at rebuildingheritage.org.uk. The application is quite short. We estimate it takes about 30 minutes to complete and you can express an interest in just one, some or all types of support available. Round four is actually our bump around on the programme. We're offering business planning, fundraising, marketing and comms and legal consultancy, as well as leadership, well-being, marketing for heritage freelancers and financial literacy training sessions. Connected to today's session, we'll be offering you the opportunity to apply for expert support in small group settings with today's trainers, Sarah and Becky. You'll be able to share and discuss meaningful ways forward regarding accessibility and inclusion in the workplace over three confidential sessions. Applications for round four will close on the 30th of March this year at 11pm, so please do get your applications into us. Please do also follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore rh and please do use the hashtag hashtag rebuilding heritage now on to the session itself i am delighted to introduce you to becky morris founder of disability collaborative network with over 20 years experience in the heritage sector who works across sectors to support organizations in intersectional inclusive practice and sarah simcoe who created and founded embed dedicated to accessible affordable and inclusion focused services welcome sarah and becky over to you Hi, and thank you and welcome to everybody for this session. It's great to engage with you on such an important topic, particularly in these times. So I'm Becky Morris. I've worked in the sector, as Sarah has said, for um, a couple of decades now, and that's across departments and also in respect to intersectional inclusion. Um, I'm neurodivergent and I've got uh, dyspraxia and dyslexia, and it is my absolute joy to introduce Sarah for today's session. Hi, uh, thanks, Becky. Uh, Sarah Simcoe, I'm the founder of Embed. Um, I have a background in uh, organisational, cultural transformation and change uh, and Embed is all about helping organisations uh, across sectors when it comes to embedding uh, equality, diversity and inclusion into working practices, into conversations um, that you have within the organisation and essentially about helping you to create the, the inclusive environments that enable people to 
thrive and flourish, your staff, your volunteers, um, but then that rolls through into the experience of the visitors, of your audiences. So delighted to join. Thanks, Becky. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And it's, I think with our situation with DCN as well, is that DCN um, was founded on the understanding that we would always talk to other sectors in terms of key practice, also in terms of um, key resources, and also in terms of being able to shape heritage as to more intersectional inclusive practice across all departments and also within leadership. So we're very happy to say that DCN is Embed's heritage partner in regards to this. And um, we're really excited um, about what we're going to share with you today. So indeed, in terms of what we are covering today, this is going to be about practical tips in, in uh, writing a EDI strategy. And this is practical for everybody who's on this call. It's going to be about tips and advice, no matter what size you are, what stakeholders you have, or your budget. We're also going to be looking at a key, key cross-sector tool um, called a passports and we're going to be exploring that and understanding those particularly in supporting your staff with their changing needs we're also going to be recognizing and gathering your own tools and resources within your heritage organizations and this can be things that you start with today if you want to you can do that today we're also going to support you in identifying what information is missing and how to find it So this is a key question for the chat. Why do you think strategy has such a key role in developing equality, diversity and inclusion or EDI in the workplace? And what are the key success factors? You've got five minutes in the chat to share your thoughts. So please do share them. There's no right or wrong answer. It's always interesting when we explore the importance for different organisations and sectors when it comes to strategy. So um, I'm looking forward to the, the different views, actually. Mm. I think also within equality, diversity and inclusion, it's often about what information you have, but also fitting the pieces together in respect to your organisation as well. helps to so we've got some coming through excellent so we it helps to embed across the organization sure everyone's working towards that same goal absolutely agree with that yeah absolutely agree with that strategy is firmly agreed by senior management and should have objectives and outcomes that can be measured that commitment being really critical as part of this mm. um so it's embedded into the practice of the organization that pebble in the pond moment it ripples through mm. absolutely it provides structure and direction and allows a plurality plurality of voices um, to ensure it's comprehensive that there is uh, there's too much risk with this issue that action can be tokenistic is a really good point uh, without strategy achieving any of your aims is at risk of being piecemeal and directionless and not happening increases buy-in and stops that reaction in yeah. our response it's really interesting that you mentioned that piecemeal um, i think that's so very important and you know when we talk about strategy we're talking about an overarching approach that does organize people on that common goal that you've mentioned when we organize people around a common goal when we know the direction of travel what our destination is you know cliche a term it is calling it a journey but when we know that destination and people are organized as part of that plan i think then we can move to the place of everybody embedding it and moving away from it feeling tokenistic for sure mm. absolutely key Thanks everyone, some really useful comments. Yeah, it's fantastic. Right. So I think Sarah, we were saying literally just the other day that embedding EDI is about actually forging a sustainable future for all organizations and particularly in light of COVID as well, when intersectional inclusion is going to be key 
in meeting the changing needs of our staff, our volunteers, but also how our organisations run in meeting those challenges in a proactive way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think when we have, I've just seen the chat function as well, commitment flash up. I think when we have the commitment to do this, uh, when we have the understanding of uh, the value that comes from really embedding it, truly, truly, completely embedding it into everything that we do. I think those organisations that do that forge a sustainable future because we're considering the needs of people. It, it's a people centric approach when we consider representation, how people experience us, that then has that positive effect on the organization's profile, the reputation as an employer of choice, as a service provider of choice, as a, an experience of choice. There's that legal requirement that I know we're gonna to come to later, the obligations, if we consider the Equality Act, the obligations that we have to the people that we employ, to the people that we serve, um, being representative of the people that we're serving as well is so important that rolls through into everything that we deliver how we deliver it and the overarching experience and then that's you know when we benchmark that when we bake in what we know about the trends and the impact and societal changes and what we have already in place to your point Becky the real value of truly embedding it means that ultimately we're sustaining that um, that future for, for any organisation out there. And I think just to add to that, I think for, for when I founded DCN, that actually inclusion, um, equality, diversity, it's an exciting journey to be on as well. It is something that can be really a, just a great way of reconnecting and really thinking about what what you represent and also how you represent it as well and what those collaborative approaches can be. Yeah, it connects the dots, doesn't it? Exactly. So in terms of understanding the law, it's absolutely critical that organisations and the staff within them familiarise themselves with key legislation and standards and that you have an obligation to comply with the Equality Act the Human Rights Act of 1998 and also in terms of website accessibility in regards to all of this. This is absolutely critical but also understanding those micro inequalities that you may have as an organisation. A micro inequality is when you see something that you may, something happens, an action which may not actually be clocked at the time but is sort of rippling under the bubbling under the surface in respect to what could be discrimination and also in terms of practice that is no longer relevant or needs to be reviewed. And we've also got, as we were talking last time about bias as well and lack of accessibility. And we've got positive action, not positive discrimination. Shall we tell the folks a little bit more about that, Sarah? So I, I, I know we both have lots of conversations around um, you know, we help organisations to create their strategies, we help them to uh, take action, embed them, and one of the conversations that we have quite a lot is the difference between positive action and positive discrimination. Positive discrimination is when we prefer, we uh, put actions in place that prefer certain types of people, you know, and, and, and I think when we take a positive discriminatory approach, it becomes quite tokenistic. We're not truly embedding diversity and inclusion into an organization. So for those of you that are around for the first session that we did, we touched on uh, equality, equity and justice. And that's about us taking positive action. That's about us taking action that addresses any imbalance of opportunity for people as they access facilities, goods, services throughout employment and whatever it is that somebody's trying to access uh, and leverage and take part in. It requires us to address the imbalance. When we start talking about the importance of our legal obligation. This is essentially what we're talking about, that we're going to take the action that addresses the imbalance, that ensures we're falling in line with those good practice standards uh, and pieces of legislation that are set out around equality, diversity and inclusion. Mm, absolutely, thank you. Because that is the key thing in all of this, is that in terms of legislation, heritage and museums, have their part to play in meeting that and it's an obligated role to play in respect to that. I think one of the common barriers um, of good strategies within organisations is 
one in respect to the hierarchical organization models, that kind of leadership um, management side of things where often ideas get stuck at a particular level or that feeding isn't a enabled to really create this holistic view of the customer visitor experience, but also the day to day view of staff and volunteers and the gatekeeping and gaslighting in communications really add to that in respect to what are you actually hearing, seeing, doing, but also in terms of being able to relay that back um, into leadership to actually make things happen and support processes of change. What we find is, is that ideas become limited. They, they become active discussions, not really actions. They never turn into that positive action. And the issues is with this, and particularly now, is that it limits the organization in terms of its growth and its profile. It always becomes the one, oh yeah, it's the, yeah. Yeah. Could it maybe explain gaslighting a bit more? Ah, gaslighting. Um, gaslighting is when you see a piece of information and it's been told pretty much from somebody's point of view or it is shared on the understanding that it's a little bit of the story, not the whole story. So you may find that your actions are prioritised because somebody says you have to do this now. But actually, this is what you should be instead what you should be thinking about is your priorities in terms of health and safety during the time of covid so that's what i mean by gaslighting it is something for which it's almost like um, a small part of a bigger story but that small part needs to be uh considered in other factors as well like what what exactly are you reading and engaging with like that it comes back to what we were saying last week isn't it in respect to what are we um, independent thinking as well as what you're also receiving as well. Sorted. I think the bottom line in all of this is that it's about not, we could end up with a situation for which the organisation may not understand the impacts and the influences of its own sustainability. So it becomes more reaction the staff feel overworked and it's a case of go, 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 go to keep up with everything that's going on. And the problem is with that is that there's not time for self-reflection. There's not time of key learning points. It's more is move on to the next thing, which yeah. really does need to change. And I think that gaslighting for me is where that comes in. The case, I can see that you've also mentioned it in the, uh, in the chat function. I think when we talk about gaslighting, when somebody gaslights us as well, because we focus on one part of a conversation or uh, characteristics of somebody or you know whatever the case may be when somebody gaslights us and it makes us feel like we can't trust our own thoughts our own yeah. ideas our own experiences mm -hmm. I totally agree that that has such a huge impact on us being able to embed really effective um, strategies to remove the experience of discrimination and bias so i was just playing back up that some of the comments that were going on in the chat so thanks thanks for that yes thank you because i think gaslighting is absolutely critical in respect to understanding those key barriers and also in terms of how it makes you feel as well when you think actually hang on you know what about this um, and how that makes you feel in terms of sharing ideas and also in terms of what we can do proactively to reduce that as well So, in creating a new EDI strategy, this is kind of what, where your thoughts need to be in respect to this. When we, um, whenever we help organisations with uh, the initial definition of the strategy or a review of a strategy, a refresh of a strategy, we uh, run facilitated conversations and you can do that you know with a third party facilitating it you can do this yourself internally but you start with a conversation that considers um where it is you trying to get to what is it you are striving for what is it you ultimately want to achieve what is that vision um for the organization when you're able to organize people around that vision when everybody understands where it is that we're heading i think it's far easier to set out 
the goals and the priorities that we then need to achieve in order to get there. So the first place we start is identifying that vision, confirming that vision, making sure that's uh, ambitious is great. Achievable as part of that is really important. Uh, and then we move on to the mission. You know, the mission is about how we're going to get there. Um, how we're going to get there. What is it that's critical as part of us achieving that vision? What sits at the heart of it? And a lot of the stuff that we're talking about when we consider EDI is people being at the heart of everything that we do when we create that mission, when we consider what it is that we need to know along the way. That people centric approach is always so critical. We then start thinking about, I call them wigs, I call them wildly important goals, but they are those strategic. Uh, the key priorities that you really need to deliver in order to ensure your mission and your vision are realized. And in all of this, this is almost like your waterfall approach. You know, when you set out that top level view of where you want to get to, it's the waterfall approach that takes you down the various levels into. So then what do we do? So your strategic goals is um, considerate of the actual actions that you have to take those big ticket items, the small ticket items, the things that you can do quickly, the things that maybe take a little bit longer. When you have those, when you identify those goals, and then we have that awareness of the deliverables that we expect, the mm -hmm. outcomes that we expect as a result of that, then we can measure it. Then we can measure whether that's effective. So there's a lot of work that needs to go behind creating that strategy. One of the things that's really important, and it lends itself to the, uh, the commitment comment earlier, was the need for that sponsor, for somebody to provide that level of support and sponsorship that's championing the conversation around EDI, that helps you unblock blockers, um, that ensures that we can move forward, be that time, resources, budget, you know, whatever the case may be. But having that commitment is so very important to this. So when we start talking about, I call it a strategy on a page, this would be a strategy on a page if it was completed. When you have the view of what it is that you're striving for, when you know what you're going to keep at the core of your approach and the mission, you then move on to those wildly important goals. And then that helps you to identify those core deliverables that form part of your actions. Mm -hmm. When we have that shared view, I think it's then far easier um, for people to get involved, to want to get involved because they understand what it is that we're trying to, to do and deliver and the reasons why we're trying to do and deliver. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it, because the key thing is with strategy is that it doesn't have to be a lever arch full of paper. <laughs> it literally can be something that can be pinned up on a board somewhere, literally like that. And it's a it's a developmental, movable um, key document. It's not Absolutely. something. It's live. It's live. It's never fixed in stone. You will course correct you will uh, refresh, you will edit, times will change. We've seen that over the last year. Um, audience experiences change, staff experiences change, the things that we know about what it is that we're gonna deliver as an organization change. So it's definitely something that you will continually review, mm -hmm. um, but it's a tool that really helps us to ensure at all times asking ourselves, do we know where we're heading? Are we doing the right stuff in getting there? And what else is it that we need to know in order to continually um, course correct continually ensure we're doing the best we can to deliver those visitor experiences so one of the key elements of this is evidence-based approaches and it's very easy to get overwhelmed um, with material and information but there are key pieces of material that we'll come on to later in respect to where to find them but one of the key sort of measurables and tied tried and tested ways to sort of collate information is through the pestle model that we were talking about last week which is your political economic social technological etc your smart which is your obviously your specific measurable achievable realistic like that your swats in terms of your strengths and your threats but also in terms of where your models are in terms of what is the impact of COVID within your own area and where are you based in terms of your organization, which is, we're going to share some stuff with you later in respect to that. Yeah. These are so important because, um, and I can see some chat as well from Sarah, they have to remain live. They, you know, strategy is like a policy or process. If those things work well, they're there to facilitate, uh, what the organization needs to do, what the organization wants to deliver, not to dictate how that should be delivered yeah. without being fed into by 
the voice of people within the organization from research you know it's it's facilitary it's there to enable the best experience mm. possible the same for strategy it's there to ensure we can um, move towards and facilitate the best experience possible mm. as an organization and i think it reduces that risk of actually running towards particular projects or particular points because you feel you have to yeah. it's also about measuring it in terms of your impact within your communities and your audiences as well. So in terms of information and trends, it's about understanding what makes up your audiences and potential audiences as well. And this is also across the nine protective characteristics such as disability, age and race, but also other key factors in respect to social and economic background, people's income levels and digital access. Now, you can find that very easily by mining uh, local authority stats and data, uh, which are renewable and very easy to find on Google. Um, they're absolutely fascinating as well, because what you can do is identify the needs of the audience and your people, but also compare them to local and national factors. So similar demographics, um, and also in terms of things such as transport impacting the ability to access your site. So if there's any reductions, if there's any um, situations in terms of town centre redesign, where would that actually impact on your organisation? Is there an opportunity there for you? So there's some really good stuff out there. Office of National St Statistics, it goes without saying, absolutely critical tool in terms of the national picture, particularly in respect to the impact of COVID as well. Again, think, all online. Yeah, and I think that, that looking at the councils is a really good one. Mm. I, I, I've just finished on a project where it was for a large combined authority and the research and benchmarking that we did meant that we were able to see across the country what other combined authorities, district councils, county councils, borough councils, whatever the case may be, what they were doing, not only to capture the stats, those stats were really interesting and really useful to create that picture of demographics and audiences and communities. It also identified some of the stuff that they're doing that you could actually leverage. You know, those local um, initiatives that they're implementing as a result of the need to embed EDI. You know, there's, there's stuff there as well that you could absolutely jump on the coattails of. Totally. Oh, absolutely. That I think is absolutely critical and something for which you can actually make as part of your working day. You know, what's going on out there? What can yeah. I actually take out and um, go and have a look at? <clears throat> the key thing is as well, it's about collaborating with your greatest asset, which is your people, your staff and volunteers. And the key thing is with that, it's about hearing from the lived experience and particularly people who are socially connected within your communities. And it's a great way of influencing representation as well. So these are key tools, key areas of thought that you need to consider. One of them is a staff survey, isn't it, Sarah? Absolute key one for... Yeah, and can be really simple to put in place. We've... Um... You know, for those of you more familiar with Embed, um, I'm just going to say Embed because DCN is the heritage arm of Embed. So I'm just going to make it easy and say Embed. When we talk about Embed, um, everything that we share today is ultimately part of like a life cycle. It's like a, a, a roadmap to some of the areas that you need to get to when we think about the tools that are going to help Embed in change. Uh, and, and we support each of these stages as well. So we, we have experience in doing all of this. One of the ones that works really well, it's quite simple to do is a staff survey. You know, when we are looking to inform a strategy, when we're looking to inform um, the actions as a result of, of creating that strategy, that voice of your staff, of your volunteers, of the people that you're serving, your visitors, is, is, is also really important. So you can do staff surveys, you can do visitor surveys. They're a really simple way of being able to understand the experience that people are having right now. Um, it's safe, it's confidential. You can dive down to that level of detail that you want. You can keep it as anonymized as you want. But it's a really useful way of us mining uh, really insightful data that can help to inform those plans. And it can be how included people feel or how accessible they feel the website is, what ideas they have around improvements that could be made uh, to you know practical things like tools and 
websites and policies and procedures, but also in terms of behavioural barriers that people may be experiencing. When we experience any kind of discrimination, you know, there are different types of barriers that we experience. And we covered that in the first session. You've got attitude, con uh, communication, you've got the physical space, you've got the digital space, you've got transportation that Becky mentioned on how to get to you hearing from those people directly in their experience in the form of a survey is a really simple way to quickly um, analyze analyze that mm. that's exactly it because often when people have uh, an experience of di discrimination it, it they internalize it sure. and it's one of those elements where that is the surveys are such a key tool to really start to mine where those behaviours are. Definitely. Well. And yeah. you know, sometimes having these conversations, to your point, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And people don't want to be known to share their views. And we, we talk about, you know, never interrupting people when they're sharing their voices, but also providing the opportunity to share them in ways that is far more uh, comfortable for people. And we call this sharing our perspective silently. When we write it down, staff surveys, feedback forms, you know, th those types of tools. Um, it really allows people to share their views without that level of fear that they may have. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly in a competitive sector. Yeah. Like and these, 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 normally it takes about a couple of days to, to create it, to run it, to analyse the data. It doesn't really take that long. Um, how do you build, tr I've just seen the chat function, how do you build, tr yeah. build trust in situations where orgs of health surveys but not actually any uh, was progressed with anything? I think one of the big things there, Elizabeth, Birth. sorry you've sent out two panelists please do don't forget to include panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see your um your information um when it comes to building trust uh there the really has to be and it goes back to that commitment you know there really has to be the commitment to take uh practical actions and to be really transparent about doing that because you're right you know we can mine this data but unless we do something with it then we're really never going to make change happen mm. And that requires us to, us as in the royal us, all of us, uh, to take ownership, to make ha actions happen as a result of it. And a large part of that will be from a uh, commitment within each of your organisations as well. We can help guide, coach, influence all of those conversations. Commitment has, has to come from within in order yeah. to, to embed some of that change. We're that going to come to some of these questions a little bit later on as well. So yeah. be aware that we are clocking them. Yeah. I think with particularly with the last question as well, because there's some things that we're going to be sharing with you that will actually help in respect to that question too. Sorted. Another key element is a focus group, isn't it? And the great thing is, is that this is can be a safe environment to get people for people to share their experiences and particularly from people with underrepresented groups. And it can be one of those opportunities to as well to really share creative ideas and think and thinking and if you've got that as we say that action attributed to it like that then it's a really key exciting opportunity for the organization and in terms of going forward yeah and this goes a little bit further than surveys yeah you know surveys will be a set number of questions and you know you you complete your survey when we do um, focus groups, it dives into a little bit more detail. It allows us to facilitate uh, a conversation. I'm actually in the middle of a week where I have about seven focus groups for an organisation. And we're running those focus groups based on different roles of people. And what I'm finding is in those focus groups, when we facilitate those in a really, again, confidential uh, and, and safe way, that is about encouraging people to share their experience uh, in a way that allows us to get some of that stuff out, you know, the threats, the concerns, the challenges, the, the needs, the asks, and helps to move to them the place of mining all of their thoughts around ideas and suggestions and recommendations of how we can do some of this stuff. Um, the focus groups are really useful tools in mining the ideas and recommendations, because when you're able to facilitate those conversations and um, give people the opportunity to move into that space of creative idea uh, generation by far they really help to identify you know, good practice opportunities for improvement and again you know dependent on the number of sessions that you run a, a good focus group runs for about two hours and um, we'll have a nice mix of people maybe up to about 10 people um, but it doesn't really take that long to analyze the data neither and then the way in which you let uh, you 
leverage the information is to identify the themes and the trends in the suggestion in, in the experiences and then the suggestions and the recommendations that an organization can make as a result of it so again follows on from a survey get dives down into a bit more detail far more contextual because you're in the space digitally or physically having a conversation with somebody and exploring their thoughts and, and their experiences yeah fantastic I think as well, one of those key elements is about where where is the organisation in terms of its policies and its and its processes. So being able to look at and review uh, any existing policies and processes from an EDI perspective. And again, it's like identifying those micro inequalities that may not be clocked at this present time but are happening nonetheless but also in terms of identifying those negative impacts in terms of those existing policies and processes when were they last reviewed and what are there any identified barriers in respect to the nine protective characteristics intersectional inclusion but also in terms of identifying um, potential societal um, difference as well and also in terms of the language the imagery the tone and the style of the whole policies and processes and whether or not it needs updating with key recommendations mm. absolutely yeah I think these were these when I see these work really effectively these work well on their own don't get me wrong yeah like with anything we've got to do something with the, the things that we identify we have to take action um, these work really well when they're done in conjunction with focus groups or a staff survey mm -hmm. because when you can review the good practice that we're writing down and making available to people whether that's policies practices criterias resources um you know guidance documents job specs whatever the case may be when we can review that written information and then we have the conversation with the people that are actually experiencing in practice it gives us a really nicely fully rounded view of where we are today um, where we need to change the policies and practices to then support a more effective experience for those people that have shared have shared their experiences to date. So they, they work really well hand in hand. Um, the length of time it takes to do an, an, an impact equality review kind of depends on the organisation. It depends on how many um, areas and, and document pieces of documentation we have to review, um, the level of which you want to go into the detail but it, but it's not a process that takes weeks and weeks and weeks you can do a really good review within um you know one or two weeks mm. uh, it really does depend on the needs of, of the organization but really useful when you also wrap in that benchmarking element that we mentioned earlier you know looking at what other organizations are doing what councils are doing any kind of public authority that's really useful information to play into it as well absolutely it's so key i think particularly right now we're also looking at a comms and marketing review and that is so important in respect to what messages are you giving out as an organization but also in terms of similar the language and the imagery in terms of your photographs that you have or in terms of your tone and your style and this can be both your hard copy as in your newsletters right through to your website and social media and the particularly now in respect to people aligning themselves more towards digital practice in the time of COVID. It's about the reputation and profile as an inclusive organisation. And in terms of what your visitors and customers of your services and organisation, you're going to be challenging potentially their perception of you. So that's a really good opportunity to start checking out what your shop window looks like. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the impact of COVID is a long one. It's a mm. long-term impact. Yeah. The, the lessons that we've learned across the, the last year are lessons that we are going to continue to need to leverage yeah. um, over the coming years because, you know, it's great that the light's at the end of the tunnel and we're doing so well as a country in terms of vaccination, but it's not going to go back to like it was before that first lockdown. The impact of this is long-term and when we hear from the experience of people, when we have those surveys and interviews and focus groups, and then we're looking at our policies and procedures. Policies and procedures are part of the foundation of an organisation, the way in which you govern, the way in which you operate, the way in which you ensure that's effective and, and, and inclusive. 
when we then start looking at the language we use in the way in which we communicate the way in which we promote ourselves as an organization it does have to consider that long-term impact because mm. of covid because the way in which the world is, is going to work moving forward for me will remain changed so we have to be a bit more um savvy with with the ways in which people can experience us right the way in which they can engage and, and access all of the all of the wonderful stuff we can access in heritage absolutely and the key thing is is i feel as well is that if you have um any if you have your shop window as inclusive it attracts the diverse workforce it's it it will naturally become a place where you think i need to check that place out because i think that i could work quite well there yeah and i you know we work with lots of wonderful heritage organizations and yeah. there's one that i work with i don't know if she would be okay with me naming them so i won't um but there's one large um multi-located um organization that i've we're having the great fortune of, of supporting and they refer to their um website as their ninth heritage location i think that's a really important way of looking at it when you think of your strategy and you think of all the stuff that you've got to do and get to I think that's a really useful way of looking at it because it also means not only are you going to be able to respond to the impacts of COVID, it's also a really accessible way for people that would not typically see themselves as being uh, heritage visitors as being able to access that now. And I think the comms and the marketing, uh, the, you know, the accessibility of that is really important. Following on from that as well is the key element of a digital audit. Mm. So within your website, you do have the website accessibility and mobile apps, public sector legislation that was brought in in 2018. That's for all central government and local government funded museums and heritage sites. And that includes projects as well, externally funded projects. But the key thing is, is that digital website accessibility can be something that people can find in themselves quite daunting and also where to start. So a digital audit can be really useful in how you, how your existing website measures up to WCAG 2.1 AA, which is used for good practice guidance. And also in terms of it being your shop window, like we were saying earlier, and how that impacts us uh, for the organization in respect to the reputation and profile to your community and also to the world yeah. as well yeah and again locked in for covid yeah absolutely in the last year maybe not necessarily the first month or two uh but since that point if there's an area that we see far more people uh recognizing its criticality it's uh, digital auditing uh, it's definitely up there because that digital accessibility the way in which we can experience your you know your next location your digital uh, location um, is so critical and I think when we get that right um, that's absolutely about usability for disabled visitors um, disabled employees because you know the same uh, compliance applies to your internal uh, internet sites as well um, but it also then flows through into a far better experience for anyone that comes to visit the, the site. You know, when we talk about intersectional inclusion, it really does ripple through everything. If we consider the needs of, of one protected characteristic, then it allows us to start considering the needs of others and how they overlap and intersect. So when we start looking at really good practice around digital audits, um, using those good practice guides around the WCAG, um, understanding how people navigate and use the space that is online and what that platform really feels like um, it, it's such a, a useful way to align that with comms and marketing with you actually I think those two things work so beautifully hand in hand if this is your platform comms and marketing is your content that works so beautifully you know whether you're talking about collections or uh, you know online tours or whatever the case may be um, and this is something that doesn't take very long you know the the quickest that we've done uh, in terms of a, a digital access audit has been a couple of days to do the audit and do the reporting. Um, and that's because it's been a singular, pretty simple site. Um, the, the longest it's taken us is about five days, but that's because it's been multiple site names, um, uh, sites that we've got, multiple websites, subsites that we've had to go to. Um, so it can be quite easy 
um, for us to run a digital audit. And there's some really great um, people out there that are supporting us to embed in delivering some of this stuff. Um, missed what name has been given to the multiple site organisations website on this particular point. Um, it, they just called it their ninth location. They've got eight physical locations. So they refer to their website as their ninth visitor location. So if you've got one physical location, this can be your second. Um, so it's, it's, it's the next uh, visitor experience, visitor location. And I think if people feel that they need some leverage in respect to this, it's the click away survey for 2019. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a webinar yesterday with um, an organisation that focuses on disability confidence and 75% of disabled uh, people and their families click away from a website because it's not usable, it's not accessible, it's tough to, to navigate. So when you think about in the UK, uh, the spend, the power, the purple pound we call it, for disabled people alone, um, the spend is approximately 274 billion a year. That's just disabled people. Now, when we think about the 75% of disabled people and their families will click away from uh, a website due to inaccessibility, mm -hmm. that's a huge amount of the purple pound that we're also not bringing into uh, heritage sector. So it has real implications to uh, the, the sustainability of an organization. If there's so many people moving away, if we're not able to mm -hmm. leverage, harness, attract. Yeah. And I think just to, to, to add to your point, absolutely, Sarah, I think, I think for me as well is that they won't necessarily complain either. They will just walk away. They will just yeah. go and they may not come back. So in terms of leverage, that's a key element in respect to that is the click yeah. away and also yeah. in terms of the purple pound. So in terms of physical audits, um, this is um, done as a site visit and it considers the sensory, cognitive and physical conditions in respect to the building itself and its identification of key barriers that can cause difficulties for people across the nine protective characteristics and existing good practice. That also includes neurodiversity as well. And it's about how our design and decisions in terms of our physical spaces can influence visiting, working and engagement and what processes we may need to put in to overcome those particular barriers and designs. The key thing is, is that it's about how your organisation is meeting legislation. And that can include and not limited to health and safety, British standards, and also existing and current fire regulations. We also know that your workplace needs to be part of that audit and it is in relation to the changing needs of your staff. And that could be somebody who may have been diagnosed, God forbid, with a chronic health condition to a situation in respect to a broken leg or a broken ankle. So it's about how that is reflected within your workplace and your workplace needs. And so much more impact as well now because of COVID. Yeah, exactly. With, with any of these tools, actually, you know, COVID is such a fundamental yeah, it's, part of the thought process. It's absolutely amplified everything yeah. and why intersectional inclusion is, is at the core in terms of recovery. Yeah. And I think it's about with particularly with physical audits, it's also about things that you may assume are OK. But actually, you may think that when you have a site visit from an independent will go, well, actually, if you do it like this, it will be a lot easier for particular staff members, volunteers, and also yeah. your visitors as well. Yeah, I think often when we use the word audit, people go, <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> what's that?" <laughs> it's so painful. Yeah, I think but I've actually, had. I've had people really say, "Constructive." Oh. Yeah, yeah, really constructive. What yeah. we always try to be is uh, your constructive critical friend. Is yeah. what one of our consultants uh, named it. Um, but they are, they are really constructive. They're not yeah. finger wagging, oh, telling you everything in your organisation. It's terrible. It's not that. No. It's about calling out the good, spotlighting the things that need to improve, looking at ways in which we can keep the people-centric approach right for our people, for visitors. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you there because one of the things I get asked sometimes is, have I passed? Have we passed? And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, I'm not sure what you mean. So with an audit as well, it's actually a really great opportunity to take a snapshot of where you are yeah. in terms of your building. It needs to be said as well, um, just to add to, to all the goodness that we're sharing at the moment, is that listed, it, you still need to meet your legislation even if you're listed. And there's ways, there's some wonderful opportunities and technology out there, particularly if you're listed. Um, so this is about leveraging those actions and also seeing where they fit within listed status as well. Everything's about... possible. Wasn't there an abbey that popped a, an elevator in the middle of the... Yes, that's right. Yeah. If an abbey can do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was one of those, it, it, they're amazing because you think, no, that's amazing. Yeah. Like that. But the key thing is with that as well, that it, they've taken time to consider yeah. the design and also in terms of invest, not in just money, but in, in time, collaboration, feedback to make sure that when that's put in, it's the best it can be. Yeah. And it's like with all of the other audits as well. Some of the things that we identify will be easy, quick wins, simple yeah. things to fix. Don't do, also, please don't sit there thinking everything that's going to come out of a digital audit is expensive. Anything that's going to come out of an equality review is expensive. Anything that comes out of physical audit, expense, that's really not the case. Some of the stuff that comes out is a real slight, simple change to a working practice or a location or the type of signage that we use or training you know it's not all huge budgets required to embed some of this i think it's important for people to recognize there will be a whole variety of things that we uh, we need to address absolutely and it's about leveraging that budget as well yeah. so it's not like right that's it i'm sorry it's all got to go it's more about actually what can we do with what we've got yeah you know at the moment so in terms of action planning this is the key bit so it's about how you can embed embed edi across your organization with some of the suggestive key areas of thought we're sharing with you what are the people priorities and what are your staff and volunteers telling you in respect to the organization itself what what have you gleaned from the audits what are the findings telling you in relation to all of this and what are those internal and external influences that you have? So your PESL, your SMART, your COVID impact, your uh, Office of National Statistics, your click away and all that stuff. What are the time frames that you're working to? Now, heritage folk, you know, <laughs> don't try and do it all. But also, who can you collaborate with in making it easier for everybody like that? What are you doing well? Don't forget, you need to think about what you're doing good as yeah. well and celebrate that. Really flag mark that as well of what you're doing really well. This is not all about negativity. It's actually really good, positive action. Absolutely. And I think what it really helps, you know, some of the tools that we're sharing today, the ones that we've shared so far, is you really understanding where you are today. Yeah. Where you are today, where you want to get to tomorrow, what works really well now but what do we need to change in order yeah. to really get to where we say we're going to get to in that vision and mission? And then part of that requires us to connect the dots. All of that information we're going to glean from assessments and reviews and surveys and focus groups is are going to enable us to connect the dots. The criticality of this, the connecting the dots around forging that sustainable future. Um, our ability to seek that support and buy-in really then is linked into the forging of the sustainable future when we then include examples of where it's working well and when we're seeing organizations really shift their pace when they do this right now, there's really great research out there at the moment uh, and one of the organizations i always go to is an organization called mckinsey's and oh, yes. mckinsey's do a report called diversity wins and they've been tracking about 1049 i want to say organizations over the last three or so years uh, they've been tracking it specifically around gender and ethnicity more than anything else i'd like to see them broaden it yeah. but what they're trying to do is evidence uh, the importance on embedding diversity and inclusion into the working practices and what they're finding is those organizations that they're tracking the ones that are embedding it the ones that are using the information they find and glean that are embedding those actions that bring about real change 
are seeing a far greater level of uh, performance against the targets, against the people that they're trying to um, influence and attract. So I think from a gender perspective, uh, it was something like the latest stat from May last year, I think was 25% more likely to outperform if we consider gender representation, if we consider ethnicity, then it was something like 36% now, more likely to outperform organizations less diverse than you. And those that were not doing this were in, they call it the fourth quartile, but essentially it was, they were 29% more likely not to perform, to underperform against the targets that were being set. So this stuff, when we start looking at the action plan, it is helping to connect the dots for the people that we need to then convince to commit to helping to embed the, the changes on, on the back of EDI. Beautiful. The key thing is with, particularly with the impact of COVID as well, and also that all of our needs change at any point in our lives, that we need to consider workplace adjustments. Yeah. And adjustments mm -hmm. can be simple. Um, it needs to focus on equity and fairness in respect to the individual and also that it needs to be a two-way conversation, which we'll lead into in a bit. It's also a really important opportunity for organisations to really look at developing their existing knowledge and resources. And those resources come, can come from existing systems and also in terms of introducing things such as flexible working. We also need to have transparency between the employer and the employee, particularly in respect to what has been agreed and also how that will be actioned. You've also got, and this is really important to share with you, the access to work government funded scheme, which can be used in processes of recruitment, but also in terms of retention of talent as well within your organization. And there is key guidance in respect to that. Um, what I would do is I would suggest going to the access to work fact sheet, uh, which gives it all in a really nice um, key points for you. The key thing is as well is that we have a key tool to share with you uh, called the passports in respect to supporting not only the employees within the organization to thrive, but also for employers to effectively plan, support and be their best at work. And also this is key to consider the actions from the audit that you have received in respect to what your spaces look like as well. So in terms of inclusive and accessible collaboration tools, these are just things to get you thinking about in terms of what you may have been using over lockdown, but also in terms of how you can build on those and also record them in some way where it be an Excel spreadsheet on what can work and also works well in terms of collaboration tools, particularly if you're still going to be online for the foreseeable future. So I'm not going to go through all of them. There are all there. It's also worth just keeping a lookout for various sort of recommendations and trial different elements, particularly things such as project management software and also stuff such as OneNote and Trello as well that can be yeah. shared. There's a definite theme in focus group feedback, staff feedback, um, and that's that sense of not being as included right now. Yeah. Um, because people, you know, are working from home and, and relying digitally. And, and for me, that those top set of collaboration tools, such as Microsoft Teams and Zoom and mm. Skype, Pow Wow Now is just another version of one of those platforms, if you've never heard of it. The ability for people to connect and, and talk and check in on each other is, is, is even more important right now. So uh, definitely encourage you at the very least to look at some of those collaboration yeah. tools if that, they're yeah. not already in place. Just a key tip as well, if you've got anything in relation to how they work, you know, that's a really good trial, tried and tested guide, keep that in your library as well so you can send it out to various teams and volunteers if they're not sure how to use it as well. So this is part, uh, the workplace passports. Um, Sarah, I'd like to hand that one over to you if I may. Uh, so workplace passports is something that was created, gosh, I want to say like 15 years ago maybe and we have the great fortune of one of our consultants being the lady that originally created it uh, when she worked at BT. Uh, the passport is aimed at being a live record of any of those workplace adjustment needs that you have and it's a live record of the conversation and the agreement you make with your manager in a confidential conversation 
um, which talks about some of those needs that you may have that enable you to be the best you can be in the workplace to do that in a really comfortable way um, to ensure that you can do everything that you need to do within your role um, and it can be everything from you know technology assistive tech uh, types of chairs you know it can be physical equipment it can also be in um, the non-physical so flexible working hours in understanding around appointments it it really allows people to share their needs whether that's one where we have condition or an impairment whether it's about caring responsibilities parental responsibilities um, any needs related to other protected characteristics such as observance of faith um, it really allows us to specify um, our adjustment needs and to keep that in the place that um, creates the agreement between you and your manager in a really nice supportive uh, and in, informal way I think this is it because at the moment particularly within heritage you have a lot of self-advocacy yeah. so you have to remind people in terms of what needs to happen when it needs to happen and there's always that sense that you're almost having to sometimes defend uh, what you need um, in particularly as the workplace gets busier or there's a key project yeah. this gives a, a great opportunity for people to plan and also in terms of reduction of self-advocacy and also in terms of where we are in terms of our own knowledge as employers as well definitely great way to educate what you see on that previous screen is just a bit of a snapshot of um, the embed passport we've got a free resource um, you'll get the instructions of how you can um, request that from us offline, but there's a, there's a free resource. That's just the, the little screenshot that you see. Yeah. So as we were saying, it's a simple set of questions and also that it's completed by you and it's voluntary as voluntary. well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a really key point, particularly if you have um, a hidden disability or you've got a neurodivergent profile like me, it helps build understanding between you and your line manager about your needs. But if those needs change, for example, and you have your emergency down at the store or at the museum itself, your employer can plan ahead and think, actually, hang on, we need to ensure we've got extra staff or extra support because somebody's broken their leg or they've got yeah. um, a, an illness at the moment or they've got parental responsibilities that means that we can't call them out on site at five o'clock in the morning like that and I think that it's an incredibly flexible system as well in Absolutely. terms of yeah it can be digital paper-based or a spready and the key thing is it's a record of the discussion and the agreement between you and your line manager as well and it provides a record to review again if there's anything that's happening that isn't quite meeting the mark or that there's key work coming up that may need yeah. extra support. 19%, 19% of working age adults have a condition or impairment mm. and majority of us will meet our disabled selves through the course of our lives. The prevalence increases, you know, we're an aging um, society. So that definitely increases with age and that ability to review that ongoing is so important as needs change, as you know, the conversation needs to change based on what is going to help you. The, the really useful thing about this as well is, you know, these conversations can be pretty uncomfortable for people, but it allows you to avoid having that initial uncomfortable conversation again, because when you have it once with your manager, in theory, this is your record that then follows you around um, the organization by way of helping to then onward educate the next person that you work for uh, and, and, and I think that's a really important point to know you know I, my what well, I've got a, um, three conditions one of them is neurological I fall over a lot I would be the person breaking my leg um, so having somebody understand that I might need some evacuation procedures should I fall down and break a leg again is so really important to me and to avoid having to repeat that conversation again mm -hmm. as to how I ended up with a neurological um, condition I'm a bit conscious of time. We've had um, a question in respect to um, what would happen if there is mistrust with a current line manager. So like that. Yeah, I think we're going to cover Q&A's on at the end. Yeah. Um, but the trust is a really important one. And I think it has to be um, when you embed 
a tool like a passport, you have to position it in the right way. And that means that when you are embedding it into the organization, every people manager, every person that's going to um, use it um, really has to understand the principles that sit behind it. They're confidential. They are there to support the employee, the volunteer um, in um, in and throughout employment. And it has to come with the, the expectation that people will hold that information in the right way. The, the, there's a slide that we're going to come on to where um, we're going to tell you what it is not. And I think that probably plays into what Becky's just mentioned. Yeah. Just mindful of time. Exactly. And the key thing is, as we were saying, it's, it's regularly reviewed. And this yeah. could be something that is quarterly, half or annually, but also that it's flexible. So like we were saying, if it's a start of a project or changing circumstances, you've got to Absolutely. move a store and you've got to carry lots of stuff down the stairs not a great idea if you've got um dyspraxia like me um i'm not very good at carrying things downstairs so you and me walking downstairs together yeah. interesting. <laughs> so it's that whole thing about okay if becky can't do that can she be at the bottom of the stairs checking stuff off yeah. so you're not yeah. having to advocate we're going to do this for you this is more about the employer taking that time out to be able to plan as well in terms yeah. of impactful uh, work and exercises this is what it's not like that so i think this is where the trust comes in you know i i've often heard conversations about what where, where is my information going to be who's going to use it for what what is the intention of me sharing this information the, the the point of the passport is to support you in ensuring you've got the workplace adjustments that you need in and showing you have the support from your manager and your colleagues that you need to do what you do in the workplace that's it that is essentially it. it's the supporting tool it enables you to share information um, that creates the best experience possible for yourself what it is not is a tool that works in isolation of anything else to do with edi it absolutely forms part of that strategy to create inclusive environments where people can be their wonderfully, gloriously authentic selves. It is not a tool to confirm roles and responsibilities. This is only about ensuring um, we're able to support workplace adjustment needs, that we have a record of that. If you think of your DSE, your desktop assessment, this is talking about the individual need rather than just equipment. Um, it is not a tool to manage performance of somebody. This is not here as the stick. This is not here to um, beat somebody down based on performance. That's not what this tool is about neither. And nor is it there to manage any kind of disciplinary or play into grievances. This is a supportive mechanism for enabling people to be their best selves in the workplace. It is not there to play into any other uh, action, intention, desire from, from anybody outside that, that process. But that does require it to be communicated it effectively uh, for it to be implemented appropriately and for anybody involved in that process to know why it's there and how to use it and i think this is where we're coming from in terms of those key thoughts and tools that we were sharing earlier in that that can actually tackle some of those issues as well as the passport being yeah the tool. and i think with any of these tools the one point that i would make is these are not things you can just lift up and drop in no these require you to do so as part of an overarching plan and strategy you know, some of them, some of them are really simple, but they really can't be done in isolation. And, and, you know, the, the, none of these things are silver bullets, you know, all of this needs to form part of a larger plan in order to bring about change. So as we were just saying, it's a proactive opportunity. It's not reactive. So it gives your employer the opportunity as well to really think things over, look at any current resources that you've got as a workforce and workplace, but also in terms of what you may need as well. Also, it reduces the need of self-advocacy, which is absolutely key. Sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with um, capacity and resources in respect to museums and heritage there's a lot of self-advocacy yeah. when actually then this is more about reducing that and becoming more proactive as well it also aligns with EDI strategy and commitment to inclusion and access for everyone and that's intersectional inclusion so as we were saying earlier about faith parental responsibilities carer responsibilities and that it's adaptable 
for all organizations in heritage. It doesn't matter who you are in terms of who funds you. This could be anything from a purely volunteer run organization to a larger um, national or regional organization. It is there and adaptable for all of you. And that it's flexible as well for existing volunteers, but also in terms of freelance staff. And it benefits the, because you've got that inclusion based in the workplace, this will eventually trickle down into the inclusive customer and visitor experience. And it plays into legal obligation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of the passport and EDI, the key thing is within the sector recovery, there will be colleagues of ours who have had COVID or are experiencing long COVID and the passport itself will also support colleagues and family members, their own family members who are shielding. So, and this is including, but not limited to, if they have a chronic health condition, uh, like myself, I'm type one diabetic, uh, their age, and also if there's any disabilities as well. And this includes their family members. And there's, it's absolutely critical as well to understand that if people are experiencing long COVID and recovering from COVID, what that working system is going to be look like so you don't lose that talent yeah. in the workforce. We were talking yesterday, so there's someone yeah. who didn't know um, who uh, unfortunately um, tested positive for the virus in the second lockdown mm. and early 30s, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, really healthy, runs a uh, young family, you know, there were no underlying conditions. Uh, and his experience was hospitalised and, you know, in intensive care. His experience with the long COVID has been the even more debilitating element of it. And having the passport, being able to have that conversation at the point in time he's able to go back into work is mm -hmm. going to be so important because the impact for him is ongoing. It's significant fatigue, um, not being able to pull up the energy to you know, engage with your own family, let alone go to work. The, yeah. the reality of long COVID, um, mm. for me, is one of the core factors of, of inclusion right now. Mm. I'm not too sure. And for me, it's always that extra stress. And being yeah. in a competitive sector, it's always that kind of, am I going to be replaced? What's going to happen to me? I've got a mortgage to pay. And it just doesn't help your recovery. No. So it's that whole process of how the passport can help, but also in terms of the hybrid models of working, that it's actually going to be a lot easier if we do continue to work from home as much as we can. Yeah. And also who can go in and who can stay at home yeah. as well. So there's lots of things, possibilities from that. Yeah. And the next two slides really play into that, don't they? It's then about yeah. educating people uh, on, the back, on the back of all of that stuff. So we do quite a lot in people development. Um, whether it's leaders, um, whether it's people managers, whether it's staff or volunteers or stakeholders, um, you know, the training really has to go through every area of an organisation and every role of an organisation. And whether that's how we embed EDI, whether that's how we inclusively rec recruit, how we inclusively retain staff and talent, how we ensure we're inclusively engaging with members of the public into our customer services, you know, the, mm -hmm. the conversation and the education we need from a people development perspective really has to be underpinned by taking the time to understand how we impact on other human being. If you remember in last, last session, we talked about our values and our beliefs and how that manifests itself in our behavior and, and how people experience us at the tip of our iceberg, if you recall that picture. Um, this is really about educating people to understand EDI, to understand their role in embedding EDI, the impact they have on other people, and then how that has to ripple through into every mm. single thing that we do, essentially, regardless of what role it is that you do within an organization. Um, and, and, and being able to have some of those uncomfortable conversations as well is such a fundamental part. Um, and this is really where you start seeing um, the real action come about when you get everybody to look at their own selves and, and the role that they play. And then on the next slide, we take that even further around networks, um, DNI networks, employee networks, resource groups, whatever we want to call it. You know, it's, that's kind of following on from staff surveys and focus groups. It's keeping the conversation going. Mm -hmm. It's providing the opportunity for people to come back together and share their experiences and highlight the barriers and work together and looking at ways we can 
impact further change ongoing as part of that strategy as we said at the top of the session it's a live um it's a live document it's a live vision we have to course correct we have to keep checking that we're doing the right stuff and employee networks and, and resource groups when they're used in the right way uh, are just a, the most wonderful vehicle for change as a former employee network lead myself they're just such a wonderful um, vehicle for change particularly when you engage them in changing process and policy and rolling out collections and galleries and you know whatever yeah. the case may be such a wonderful uh, sounding board yeah and i think just to add to that as well completely agree with you um it's it's that whole process as well that there may be things that you look on this list and think actually i'm a member of a network and we don't do that so maybe that's something that we need to consider to sort of building capacity as well right so this is the key thing is it's about have a strategy and a plan like we've outlined today and it can be for one year it can be for two years it can be three years like that but the key thing is is to collaborate to innovate and that collaboration can can come from your local community and also in terms of partners such as your local authorities as well the key thing is though it's about prioritizing the based on the needs of your staff and your visitors and that's where essential information such as audits can be such a key part of that and that listening and learning from each other in terms of feedback and also what those processes are and ensure that there's review systems put in place for those it's about leveraging findings and good practice guidance to really create positive action going forward on what can be a very exciting opportunity to be better but also it's about being the change you wish to see as Gandhi said allegedly allegedly yeah. But the key thing is as well, is that you're not going to do this all tomorrow morning. This is also about looking at your capacity and being kind to yourselves and being patient in how this unfolds, but putting yourself on the best route you can be in respect to sector recovery and also your organisational recovery as well in the time of the pandemic. Lots of food for thought. We're going to hand back over to Sarah, who's going to take us through some Q and A. Mm. Lovely. Thank you very much. That was absolutely amazing, and a lot of really interesting information um, for people to digest. Um, we've had a lot of um, questions coming in, and um, I thought the one we would start with is is about struggling to justify the spend on EDI, um, and how do how do you make the case? Uh, when you're not seeing concrete numbers, when you can't put a, a monetary value on the risks associated with not improving um, your inclusive practice? Uh, I think it's always really useful uh, to look at what other organisations are doing. You know, if you look at within the sector, you know, think of those organisations that are doing really well in terms of reach and profile and reputation and getting people to engage with those organizations. I think if the data is not there, uh, then look towards those other organizations. What is it that they're doing differently to attract people in? Now, I'm not suggesting you lift and shift because what, one, what works for one large heritage organization versus a small privately owned um, organization versus a, a charity that is wholly reliant on volunteers, you can't lift and shift. But what you can do is learn the lessons from all of those people. I think also do your research. Do your research on, on some of that information that is out there on where the sector is right now. Um, because the, the, you know, the impact of COVID is a long-term one. This is about forging the sustainable futures. There's also data that you can leverage from um, local councils around what's happening in with, within your local communities and how that will have that knock-on effect to you as an organization as well and then there's also some you know research out there from the likes of mckinsey's and uh Vesida consulting you know there's lots of great organizations out there as well that you can mm. you can dive into essentially what you always want to do is connect the dots back to how you recover as an organization yeah. so when you look at the evidence you know with the likes of the mckinsey's when you look at the evidence of why this is so important for sustainable futures that's underpinned by some pretty hard hitting metrics 
Um, and then there's also information out there now that Dis Disability Confidence Scheme has been sharing around the stats associated with people that are going to come through the doors virtually or physically and the amount of money you miss out on if you don't ensure that you can attract um, them to experience your organisation in some way, shape or form. So we're more than happy to provide some of those stats offline yeah. there as well um, to share on the website. And there'll be more information that we can share in the working groups. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just, it, a, just yeah. a reminder there to everybody that um, we, we can't possibly reach everybody's questions in this um, next 10 minutes of Q&A, but we have got those sessions available on round four of the programme. So if you would like to continue this conversation, if you would like some support and advice and a safe, confidential space to talk about inclusion in the workplace, then please apply through the Rebuilding Heritage programme. The deadline is the 30th of March to um, the sessions with Becky and Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Becky, you were about to say something then. Yeah, I think there's always that key thing for me, which is, if it's, it sounds a really basic question, but it's always that set, uh, element of uh, how am I going to be looked after? I've, I've spent three years volunteering. I've got my postgrad. I've done this. Da, 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 I'm just making this all up. But it's that uh, as a, an example, but it's that kind of how am I going to be looked after and how does that measure up with other sectors as well? So when... DCM was first started, it was very much about what's heritage doing, which is absolutely key. That's where we work. That's where we are. But also that whole thing about what are we missing out on? And this was this, the, some of the key elements. And this is how I met Sarah as well, was those, those key elements of what we're missing out on are absolutely just incredible because not only do they increase capacity within teams, but they also increase resources it's like we were saying last week, that proaction. So if your team is tired, if it's thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do when we reopen? We've got so much to worry about. This is also about creating those key behaviors so people can feel that they can share within the workplace. And, and how does that leverage in terms of what we're missing out on as well? Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. So um, somebody's asked quite a specific question, which is that when we were talking earlier, when you were talking earlier about that kind of assessment and audit stage, um, are there any tools that you could recommend to people for that? Or um, how, how do people start that process of doing those um, assessments and audits? Which, is there a, which audit in particular? Uh, the one that's been specifically asked about is the equality assessment. So the equality assessment, when we do them, um, you know, we, we use our own um, checklists and um, checklist always feels too simple a term because there's so much that we look at. Um, but we use good practice guidance around inclusive communication and language. So um, we look out for things like coded language, masculine, mm -hmm. feminine, uh, any discriminatory or biased language that may place uh, a perception of somebody being uh, in, imbalanced in the opportunity that they're being disadvantaged in any way. So when we do the equality impact reviews, we look across policies and processes to ensure there is, they are free from discrimination and bias, that we are uh, taking that intersectional approach, that we are considering language as part of that in, in every part of the policies and the processes. And that when they're being rolled out across an organization, they're being so done so in a really consistent way that is then backed up by the appropriate training. So there are checklists and standards that we use, you know, the Equality Act, there's good practice guidance out there around inclusive comms um, and language guides. Um, there's also, we also use the Human Rights Act. We um, use Disability Discrimination Act if it's an organisation that still has that in play, if it's someone in Ireland, as an example. So we lean, lead from the legislation and the standards uh, and then we use good practice guidance around um, the soft elements of language and, and tone of, and, and that kind of stuff. But we underpin that with our own um, internal checklists and, and formats. Mm -hmm. So, and there's, um, uh, Becky has switched to the slide, so there's, there's embeds details. So um, yeah. if people have got specific questions around um, commissioning services for audits, they can contact you, can they, Sarah? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. If you yeah. use info at embed.org.uk, yeah. um, that gets to all of us, because uh, yes. DCN's the, the heritage arm. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, if you use that one, then you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. So we've got another question here from somebody asking about um, how to implement working groups or advisory boards relating to EDI? Okay, so the first place you need to start from is understanding the need of having it. 
um, which should come out of staff surveys or, you know, focus groups, whatever the case may be. The, the first things that I always go to when I uh, set them up, when I've known other people to set them up, is uh, understanding the purpose. What's that core purpose uh, for the network or for the group? Do you have your champion or your sponsor aligned to it? And then does itself have a strategy of what you're hoping to achieve? When you have that, then it's easier for you to then engage other people to become members of that particular group because they understand why they should want to get involved in, and the importance that's placed on it. Um, that then what you then need are um, like somebody to lead it, like a chair and a, and a co-chair, you know, some of the, the housekeeping and the logistics of essentially what is really going to get it up and running, having that structure in place. What keeps it going is uh, moving to the place of, of being that change agent. You know, it's important that we all share our experiences and it's important that we all keep talking about that. But to be um, a change agent, to steep anything you do in practical actions that are really going to bring about change, I think is what really keeps them going. Um, but you have to start with some of the basics around housekeeping. Um, and first and foremost, you're going to need commitment to get it up and running. Um, but I'd go housekeeping and logistics first as on unsexy as that may sound um no i think it's yeah. really important and it kind of ties into another question we were asked about um people who've had experience of, of staff surveys um staff surveys is the one that was specifically referenced being um asked to give their feedback but then no actions were taken so um yeah. just somebody wondering kind of for a little bit of advice about how do you how do you build that trust how do you how do you actually kind of turn it into meaningful action it's communication isn't it Sarah at the bottom line is is actually it's saying this is what we're going to do yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I think you um you know when we, we we hear lots of organizations that do this whether it's strategy survey you know whatever the case may be all this wonderful goodness is gleaned and nothing happens as a result of it and that really comes down to the commitment within the organization you know I can I can Becky can you know whoever can go in and have those conversations those coaching influencing yeah cajoling nudging conversations yeah. um but unless commitments really forthcoming within the organization to stand behind the change then that yeah. is difficult so then it comes back to connecting the dots for people mm -hmm. you know why do we as an organization need to do this well it's the longevity of the sector it's the longevity of your organization society is changing mm -hmm. individuals are changing we are still in the midst of the biggest inclusion challenge we've ever faced so to keep going forward, to keep the lights on and the doors open digitally or vis uh, physically, then we need to connect the dots with people. And this is about um, the visitor experience. If we're not keeping the lights on in a way that's going to be accessible for those visitors experiencing what they wish to experience, then we're not creating that sustainable future. So I think connecting the dots is key. Yeah. And it's, it's less likely to be justifiable as well as an expense. So yeah, absolutely. So I've just got one final question and, um, before we wrap up, which is um, somebody asking, uh, specifically looking at the workplace passport, is how do you manage that in an environment where potentially there are concerns around confidentiality? It's always going to be a concern. Um, and it comes down to uh, how it is positioned. So again, when you are rolling something out like the passport, um, I found what works well is real clear communication to people beforehand not, not just communication about what the passport is, but communication around the commitment and the intention of what it's going to be used for. Um, because it requires us to ensure that people feel we're going to use that information in the right way, that it's only going to be accessed and visible to the manager that you're sharing it with, that the person who's completing it owns it. Um, mm. So it's, it's that communication up front about being really clear on the purpose, how it's going to be, um, use that it, this is about the individual this is not about you know an end goal of an organization you know there's no ulterior motive it has to be steeped in that commit that commitment and the, the right intention um, and the communication up front then sets the tone mm. to allow you to embed it and over time you will see it increase there'll be a really small percentage of people that take it up straight away they become your biggest drum bangers because then they will onward articulate this is fantastic and I've got the adjustment I need yeah. and it's been really great and it's been confidential. You need those people to go, I'm going to create one, bang the drum, and yeah. then you will see that take up. So passport, yeah. it will be slowly, slowly catches the worm, um, but you will absolutely see the uptake on that once that starts happening. 
Fantastic. So thank you, Sarah and Becky, so much for your time today and for your amazing insight um, into inclusive practices in the workplace. Thank you, everybody, for attending. You will be um, getting receiving an evaluation form. And in the true spirit of what we've just been talking about, we meaningfully action our evaluation. Inclusion was not something that was originally in the plans for the Rebuilding Heritage Programme. But because we heard about it through evaluation and consultation, we added it into our programme as one of the core elements. So please do give us your thoughts on the webinar and also let us know what else you need support with. Um, the more we hear from you, the more we're able to help. Um, and just a reminder that the deadline for applying for the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, the applications will open on the 11th of March and close on the 30th of March. And you can apply for all the different types of support I mentioned up at the top of the webinar. But if you need more information, please visit rebuildingheritage.org.uk. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.